So, so the uh, uh, 67 bid was, was something we see quite often with a group of fans attending their first Worldcon and bidding. Well, I had no idea what we were doing. Yeah. We've been we've been bidding for a year and a half uh, because we were at that point we were driving down to New York a lot, and uh, uh, I don't remember when Ed uh, left California and came to New Hampshire. I think that was afterwards, but in Meshkis, but uh, we got to know a lot of people and. Uh, in the summertime, we were going to regional conventions wherever we were. I was doing Washington and Philadelphia and things like that. So we were familiar with the idea of conventions, and we thought that putting on a Worldcon would be, okay, we could do that. But oh, we didn't actually expect to win it. We didn't expect to win it, but we thought it would be a good idea to uh, put our name down in there before uh, so that people would start thinking about us. So so what happened then? Uh, it, it lost significantly in 67 started to bid for 70 and one what what, yes. what changed i don't know uh, this is another a, mir a miracle somebody, occurred Two somebody things. taking over something that dave started uh yeah because they was the, the 67 bid uh two people uh who are not in boston who thought it would be a good idea to have a boston world card put a lot of pressure on us, that is to say me, uh, the New York guy said, Yo, you need a bidding zine. Uh, why don't I start a, a Boston bid zine? And uh, with some of the Boston fans of uh, Ed Meshkis and Dave Vanderwerf will be tri-editors, and I'll call it Locus. Yeah, that happened. And that came to pass. And originally, Locus was designed as a... Uh, Boston bid zine. and I ran the first issue of the trial issue number one. Often I typed the first issue. Yeah, um, I think the idea was that by having three editors in different locations, um, they would each collect information, you know, from their area, and it would rotate. So you know, Dave would put one out, and then Ed would put one out, and then Charlie would put one out, and then. Dave would put one out. And I think right around there was when Dave didn't put it out and Charlie put it out because he got tired of waiting and then it became Charlie's. Right. So another example of something. Dave was great at starting things. He had ideas. He had dreams. But yeah. he always followed through. So I, Yeah, I really wish he could have... Uh... I believe yeah. the first trial issue of Locus had uh, started accident fandom. That was when Sue had her auto accident. Uh, the uh, other person who got involved was a guy in the West Coast called Bruce Pels, who sort of put the pressure on him. If you're really going to bid for a Worldcon, you really have to bid for a Worldcon. You can't do it halfway. Yes or no. And we said yes. And so, Tony, what what motivated you to take it on? Yeah, yeah, Tony. For years, I you said had the same. Man, I didn't like to see things being done wrong. I oh, think there was, lot, there, was, there was a lot of stuff in Boston fandom. Uh, they asked me why it was Boston fandom supposed to be not a fun thing, and I remember that fans used to love all these terrible things happening at conventions because at the next convention they could sit around and talk about how all these terrible things had happened and those of us who went to mit and other kinds of schools like that didn't think that was a lot of fun why go to all this trouble to not have it work right so the idea was okay and when we set up Nespa, we looked at other clubs and said, what are their problems? How did they come about? Club A, that everybody can become a voting member, but none of the voting members, most of the voting members won't do any work, but they'll be willing to tell the workers what to do. That's not a good idea. Uh, that was a major thing. There were a lot of things like that. Uh, most of the rules that people think are were arbitrary in this for were based upon uh, observing other clubs' problems and saying, how could we avoid this? Uh, 
I think a lot of us were engineers and we kind of approached yeah. it as an engineering problem. How do right. we put these pieces yeah. together in the most efficient way? And it was a challenge, hmm? a fun challenge. Well, well, all of us went to uh, Nikon in uh, 1967 in New York. And uh, I was uh, I went off for, to, for a vacation afterwards and came back to finish my uh, degree. And uh, at one point, Tony said to me, uh, Dick Hodder and I have been having a conversation. We think that it would be time for a really serious organization that did things like put on world cons. And uh, we're thinking of calling it NESFA and stuff like that. And you want to join? And I said, sure, sure. That sounds good to me. And that was the start, as far as I'm concerned, that uh, I think uh, when uh, Tony decided that he wanted to get involved at a serious level in running a convention, that was the key to me. Yeah. And I left town. Right. Once well, we were vaguely organized, uh, it was then necessary for me to annex the clerk. <laughs> and a year after we started Nespa, I got married it's, to Sufri. <laughs> What year did you get married? Um, it was right around April 68. of uh, April of sixty eight. Yeah, yeah, that's fifty five plus years ago. Yeah, we are still married. Congratulations! Well, I know people yes. who have been married longer. Not many. Uh, so how, how, a number how of people in my high school got married right after high school and are still married. But I don't see them. I went to the 50th reunion, but that was it. Uh, As I recall, uh, the Nariscon one bid was separate yeah. from NESPA. How, how did you juggle the two, given that NESPA itself was such a new thing? Uh, the actual... It was a major activity of NESFA, although it was not an official activity of NESFA. Okay. I think yeah. all the people in the Boston area thought, yo, let's have a World Cup of Boston. What can we do? It was riding the flow rather than trying to push people into it. We didn't know how much work it was going to be. <laughs> and we, we tried to do weird little things like uh, at that time, there weren't that many Yugo categories, so we could all fit on a card, the ballot, and all the ballots, in order to get them, the ballots had uh, postal, you return postage on them, uh, so that nobody had even had, you just had to fill it out, dump it in the mailbox, that was it. Uh, and... I guess it was uh, John Millard. I sent him the ones for Canada, uh, and he put Canadian stamps on them and, and sent them out, so that people in Canada didn't have to buy them. And we did a similar thing for England. Uh, but you know, people, the foreign fans would read, say, "Oh yeah, they can dump it in the mailbox." Right, right. If you live in the United States, and then they look and they say. Hey, it's got an English stamp on it. <laughs> uh, I believe we also distributed all the Canadian uh, Yuga nomination forms in French. Not English, just French, because it's a bilingual country and they all speak French. So well, you don't need to do English too. So what... So okay, let's flip to the other side of it. What what did what did Nesta do for fun? What there there seems to have been a really fairly vibrant social life back then. What was it? I'll just say I think it was a continuation of the uh, social life that uh, mitzvahs and the members of mitzvahs uh, had with other members of mitzvahs and other people other people in the Boston and uh, greater regional Sorry, uh, northeast my volume, area. My volume went away. Ha, huh. we hear you fine. Okay. So uh, it was a continuation of that. It's just that we were a social organization. Yeah. Uh, some of the things that I heard stories about when I moved here was House of Roy. Yes. That was, seemed to have been, been a big thing. What was it? 
House of Roy was a uh, restaurant in uh, Boston Chinatown. It started with mitzvahs. Mitzvahs would be Friday afternoons, Friday evenings, five o'clock. Five o'clock. It's and engraved then, in my brain. <laughs> yes, yes. When do and then five we, to, to six thirty or so. Right. Then we would walk over or take the train or to House of Roy, which was on is it twenty seven Tyler Street in Boston. Anyway, it was a really weird Chinese restaurant. Uh, you know, when you go in a large group to a restaurant, it often is a problem ordering. It was not a problem at Roy's. We would just go in, sit down, and say, 12. And they bring us food. And if someone wanted to see the menu, they were told they could not see the menu. <coughs> we were always sat in the back room, as Roy said, I'm seating you here so the decent people don't see you. Uh, the food was excellent. Uh, you had to eat with chopsticks. You, you eat with chopsticks. and oh, yeah. starved. That's how I learned to eat with chopsticks. <laughs> also, they would make us dishes that were not on the menu. And, yeah. Uh, some were good. What menu? The, they had a menu the for other customers. Things that I've never <laughs> seen anywhere else. Like the minced pork steamed yeah. duck eggs. Yes, that was yeah. really good. I was just thinking about that the other day. Yeah. Yeah. The bitter um, melon we was not popular, but... Uh, tell the story about water. Water story. Oh, water story, yes. Lester Del Rey was up in the area. We took him out to dinner there. We wanted to impress him with the authenticity of the food. And so we asked, as Roy is out, because it was a family thing, uh, he said, is this authentic Chinese food? And he said, yes, this is very authentic Chinese food. And I said, and this water you're pouring, is that real Chinese water? And he looks, he says, oh. He says, no, it's it's Japanese water. It's It's much cheaper, but it's good enough for you. It was lovely. We uh, ate there for every for about seventeen years. That, uh, that one. Yeah. There, there was one point. Do you remember Russell Sites? Yes. Oh God, yes. Hey, Russell McGregor Sites. Yes. There was yes. one time when I hadn't gone to the the House of Roy gatherings for a while, but I decided to go. I was with someone else. I forget who, and. For some reason, it wasn't happening that night. I just didn't know it. But Russell Seitz showed up. So we had dinner with him. And he had just come back from Biafra. Do you remember his story about Oh, Biafra? God, yes. He was teaching the Biafras how to. So he was telling us this whole story. So he was like a material scientist kind of person from. Yeah. And he had been invited. Biafra was undergoing a civil war, and people were like literally starving. They had been blockaded. And he told the story of flying in on this airplane where people are shooting at them. And then his job was to help them find ways to create munitions from the stuff they had lying around. So, how to make explosives out of fertilizer, how to make, um, uh, he was making trebuchets out of. Uh, uh, springs from Cox Trump. springs, yes, yeah. This was an amazing story, and it was like I just, you know, showed up for the regular. <laughs> I meet these strange people who have done these strange things. So, I believe well, he got enteric fever while he was there. Um, he got sick. Yeah, I don't remember what it was he got. Well, he uh, he was treated with royalty. He got to eat the rats, I guess, or you know. They were literally they were they were starving. They were they were all starving. Yeah, uh, it was a, it was tough. Um, I don't, was Seitz ever an MIT student? He was uh, Harvard. I looked him up this morning, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, he's still out there doing. You know, he works for some company that does something with bubbles and uh, look it up. <laughs> At the time, he was uh, involved with a. Uh, a group of uh, developers called Lazy Eight, which uh, he uh, one of them made a thing called a calyroscope, which was a 
a uh, liquid uh, in a frame, about like a picture frame, an inch thick, with uh, aluminum, uh, uh, powdered aluminum in a, some sort of liquid uh, carrier that rippled and uh, had a heater on it. And he left one off in the Mitzvah's library, which really impressed the hell out of people for a while. It was really cool. It was an interesting person. Um, I haven't followed his uh, post mitzvahs or post uh, career. Was he involved with, with uh, Nesva at all? I don't think he was involved with Nesva. Mm-hmm. I don't think he was that involved with Nesva. It's just enough to know that you know they got together on Friday nights and he'd occasionally show up. I, I don't think he was. Oh well, no, he saw, he spent time in the library. Yeah, yeah. He, he was and in, in, would hang around. Well, I remember one time he had a a sample case of interesting metals and uh, included one that he said, this is probably a good candidate for mithril, which... He, he never well, got involved in the... He uh, showed up in a I, Halloween party that we had hmm. as a barbarian. Then he had this arm bracelet, this heavy arm bracelet. It was weighed about a pound or two. And people were guessing what it was. He said, no, no, you're wrong. It's It's platinum. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They were using it in the lab. They were melting it down to make a crucible of some sort. But he thought it would be fun to just, you know, slap it on his arm and there's a popular in it. He had some kind of an MIT connection. I don't remember yeah. what it was. Probably through his friends at Lazy 8. Mm. Well, look yeah. him up online. There's a whole list of his, you know, associations, oh, yeah. affiliations I found somewhere. Yeah. There were a lot of... Uh, people who were marginally associated with Mitzvahs and Nesva, who have gone on and are well-known these days or had been well-known before they died. Um, uh, Suford had a friend at Radcliffe, uh, Steffi Robinson, and who was telling us that she was taking this philosophy course and the teaching assistant, she had a terrible crush on him. Uh, now, I knew him because he had been at Swarthmore with a person, people I knew from high school. And he was telling me, there's this marvelous woman that, in the class, and I have a terrible crush on her, but I have no idea what would be the proper way of meeting her. So we did introduce him, and uh, they got married. And that was the philosopher uh, David Kellogg Lewis who uh, is some regarded by many as the major uh, philosopher of the second half of the 20th century. Hmm. Uh, he also wrote the underlying philosophical uh, papers to support the multi-universe theory. So anytime you read a parallel universe science fiction stories, <laughs> we know who made this possible, even if it was written after the stories. Uh, yeah, I remember them, but I didn't. I never knew that you were involved in that. Uh, yeah, Dave was also into very much into Australia and subways. He loved to ride subways, and he, as soon as he got to the Boston area, he had to ride every line to the end and get off at every station, check it off his list. Uh, somebody who's still with us, who you mentioned very briefly in passing, was Filthy Pierre. Was yes. he involved after his his uh, his his errant Boscombe? Well, he got drafted. Yeah, he got drafted, and I think uh, afterward he didn't come back to Boston. Did he? Did didn't he? No, no. He spent uh, two years. Uh, they, they assigned him to watch a uh, uh, monitor in uh, on Shemia Island. Off the the Aleutian, the end of the Aleutians, yeah. looking for Russian missiles coming over, and uh, after he uh, after they they finally let him out, uh, he went back there as a contractor, making a really good amount of money, yes. and uh, moved to uh, Santa Barbara, as I recall. So he was there. He got involved with uh, Dirk Pearson and and Dirk's wife Sandy for uh, through uh, the. Yeah. Uh, um, anarcho-capitalist uh, movement. And that was when things like the uh, the uh, offshore uh, island idea came about. And he 
was trying to get uh, funding for a, uh, a shipboard gambling operation and a lot of other interesting things. Uh, somewhere I have a flyer that he did called If the Oceans Froze, talking about uh, building new land in the ocean that's well, free from uh, local politics. One of those groups uh, started a country by filling it a, a, a submerged reef called Minerva and they claimed they were a sovereign country. Uh, and the king of um, Tonga came over with some war canoes and took possession and said, well, if you're a sovereign country, you have a right to be invaded and conquered. <laughs> well, of course, he's still very involved in conventions and comes to a lot of conventions and provides the, um, the boards, the party boards and the uh, flyer handout boards and you know he's he's made his little niche that he contributes to and he he got an award big heart award was it yes. um for, yeah. for the things he does for conventions so you know he's still around um i noticed there was a question about and tony maybe you can address this because this is mostly suford um the save star trek uh, activities oh well we picketed there was a uh... Star Trek was canceled, or one of the shows was canceled, and for a special. And so we picketed the uh, stadium studio, the the broadcast studio in Boston. It was winter. Probably. It was cold. It was <laughs> dark. There was snow on the ground, and un unfortunately, we someone had told them that we were going to do this. So they somehow arranged to turn off all the lights in the area. <laughs> this was kind of out on Soldiers Field Road. So yeah. I'm not sure anybody noticed <laughs> that we picketed them. No, they did. Well, there were, two, there were there was a police car. There were two policemen. <laughs> and uh, they kept war with the car. We it actually when we, we bought them coffee because of, <laughs> They weren't supposed to go out and do that. We said, we said, we're going to get some coffee. Do you want some coffee? They said, thank you. And we brought them some coffee. It was all very quiet and peaceful. And, um, when it was no. over, we all went home. I don't think we accomplished it, much, but. I don't think it did. There was something about the want, Star Trek wanting that to be postponed because they didn't have the show ready, but I, it's in one of the Star Trek books. Hmm. I bet Craig Miller would know. Yeah. Uh, oh, so uh, what? What? I, I want to go back to the question: What you did for fun? What the social life? And there were there were a bunch of uh, small conventions that started in there: the uh, Conclave, Lexicon. Uh, I think there may have been some getaway weekends. I'm not sure what. what they were basically the there? getaway weekends. Lexicon was uh, the first was course. The first one was held in Lexington, uh, and Hodder ran it, and he provided for us something that was never done at one of our conventions. We had the Aurora Borealis in the summer, and he said, okay, um, top that one, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and there's never been an Aurora Borealis in any of our conventions since. But they were just getaways, you know, uh, people coming and sitting around and talking and going out to eat and playing board games. I don't know if it fell in the 60s, but there was the one with the marshmallow fight. Yes, there was a marshmallow fight. And we have pictures of Ben Bova throwing marshmallows. Ben was the other author in the area. Uh, at the time, he was mostly involved. He was marketing manager at Avco Everett, working with high-powered lasers and other things of that nature, uh, and starting to get into science fiction as a writer. Um, and then, of course, he became editor of Astounding, and then, actually, he was analog of it, and later went and became editor of Omni for a while. Uh, he was also, he was active in Bosphorus, I believe. Uh, 
but he was a very approachable, very nice fellow, as yep. are all the people we have run into. I mean, so, 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 why was he involved in the marshmallow fight? It was at a relaxicon. Oh, so of course. It, it, people started throwing marshmallows for some reason, and we have photographs of Ben throwing marshmallows. They were not on fire. I mean, we did that at scout camp, not not at Boise, not when we were in science fiction. It was just a lot of a lot of laughter. It was fun. It was fun. After House of Roy, in the evening, we later on the first Baskin Robbins in the area opened the Belmont Center, and we used to go to there and get ice cream, and then we'd go back to. Uh, Brian Suford's house in Belmont and sit around in Natter for a couple of hours. Um, Baskin Robbins was, I guess, was a real treat. Ice cream was just becoming a big thing. There was a, a place called Steve's or Herring's in Somerville that uh, made homemade ice cream. But uh, we used to make up Baskin Robin flavors, uh, like squid ink sherbet and kitty litter crunch, or the uh, hot pastrami ice cream, potato sauce. Or... Edie, I hope you'll be saving the chat. Oh, yeah, we do. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, there's a lot of interesting little um, additional bits of information about some of the people that we've been yes. talking about in there. So we're saving. Yeah, a bit thing. So uh, someone says, Filthy, I don't think, I think Filthy lives in Newark, doesn't he? He, he did for quite a while. He still does. Yeah. He lives on the top of a tower. So I think somebody commented that he lives in Washington, uh, D.C. area for a while. I don't yeah, remember the details on that. But he's been in Newark for at least 20 or 30 years. And uh, he retired. He was uh, doing a lot of consulting work in software and uh, retired uh, some years ago. He told me he was able to retire early because of his work on the do line. They got all sorts of uh, hardship pay. And many tax breaks, uh, plus the fact he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't gamble. And the only thing he spent his money at all, he had room and board. So the only thing he spent his money on was subscriptions to science fiction magazines. All the rest of it just got chunked in a bank. He came out with quite enough money to retire on at a young age. I wonder if we. This might be a good time to open the uh, floor for direct questions. Unmute people, and that that sound reasonable. Or do you want to? Anyone want to do a summing up first? Well, I, I want to mention that there's a couple of pictures that I sent to Edie. If you want to show those, they don't have. They can be run pretty fast. Uh, the Mitzvahs Library, uh, in MIT oh, in the winter. Good, yeah. And uh, I see somebody has pointed out that Sites was a was active in the Eastern Kingdom of the SCA, yes. which is news to me. Oh, no, he was, because he was a very good uh, kendo fighter. Yeah. And he, yeah. he therefore was able to uh, pretty much take down anybody who challenged him. Mm. So that's uh, what, what what issue of Twilight Scene was that? That's the MIT Science Fiction Society magazine that both um, Mike and I edited at different times. Me with Corey as a co-editor. And uh, this is the first issue I think we said. I think when you dug when uh, Edie dug it up, we don't remember who 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 did the art. It, it's one of it. the early ones. Yeah. Uh, this is this is how I remember MIT with snow, or <laughs> with slush, or with freeze, with ice on everything. 
That's the the, 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 the building seven in the great court. Yeah. And that's on the left is the student center being built in 1964. Before yeah. that, before Wait, that before, time. Before you go on about that, when I first joined Mitzvahs, the library it was in the basement of Walker Memorial in this really I, tiny room, room. dim, yeah. dark, crowded. You thought you were in somebody's boiler room or something. Um, so that was 64. And then this luxurious new student center got built and uh, we got to move to a beautiful location there. So yeah, that's it's what a, this is. This is the beginning of 65, I think we moved. Mm. This is from Bosco and One. That's what it, the label online said. Yeah. Uh, this is the new location. This is in the, the fall of 64. This is what the, the new place looked like. And there's three or four more pictures if you want to show them. I see you have a giant beaver there. Yeah, I think that was, was that the, did Pierre do that? Pierre did this, uh, this thing here. <laughs> Pierre ran that little uh, cardboard robot you see in the center. He ran that for undergraduate student president. Uh, <laughs> it lost. <laughs> but there's some ballad volumes, yeah. which uh, Mitzvah was doing. It was great. They're still yeah, there as far as I know. That's your one of yours. Yeah, that's one that I did. I think that was Fred Isaacs in the first row. Yes, somebody asked that question. Oh yeah, it was Fred Isaacs and his first wife Elaine. Even had windows. Yep. I'm sorry, I don't have any pictures of uh, Mitzvah's uh, library with people in it. No longer accessible, says Brad Verder. Oh, that was there. The, that was this is my proof that I actually had that I actually was a grad student. That was my that was my real life. Mitzvahs was just what I did for fun. Ha. Huh. Yeah. Or the other way around. And that was the Nesva publication. First one. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't talk about TAPA, the Technology Amateur Press Association, which uh Tony did strewn and Leslie, uh, uh, I remember what you did. I Corey uh, Idiolect was Corey's. Am I might have been apathetic. I don't remember. It was, it was an attempt. To, it was a small imitation of Appa L. To say yeah, I sort of was, forgot about that. I don't have any yeah. copies of it, I don't think. I do somewhere. I have them stashed in a box. <laughs> Good for you. The editor's page was called The Keg because it was Tappa. Um, when uh, I when I agreed to to share editing Twilight Zine with Corey, I at that time I thought I could not write. Corey was a very good writer, very entertaining. So the deal was she'd do all the writing, I do all the dull stuff. You know, running off the running off. I learned a lot about how to make a gestetner work properly because we were using one that was shared by a lot of student organizations. So every time we wanted to use it, we had to bring in a new ink pad and you know clean it up. Um, but anyway, my, my great claim to fame here is that when I, she finally did convince me to write something for Twilight Zine, I wrote it in Fortran. Um, I, wrote, I remember that. Yeah. It's online. You can search for it. Somebody reprinted it online. It's called Subroutine Story of Goldie. Yes. Yes. And, you know, it has her, you know, moving through the woods and through a, you know, iterated list and, you know, two hot functions and, Anyway, um, I had a plan great. to do a whole series. Uh, there was going to be, if I had a hammer, I kind of run out of material pretty quickly. This is a lot like work, I think. Mm. Well. Any more pictures? Was that it? That was it. That was all the pictures I had. Nobody Thanks. else had. So are we ready for questions? Yep. If you've got a question, please put something in the chat and we'll start calling on people one at a time. And while you're doing that, I will ask Tony to please tell the story about the collation and the Neo Pro and Isaac. Please. Well, you sort of ruined the punchline, but I'll tell. Go ahead and do it anyways. We were collating uh, proper Bosconia or instant message. I forget which one. 
probably Bob, Papa Bosconi. And it was at Harder's apartment in Cambridge. And at the meeting came in uh, a neo pro who I will not mention. I would appreciate if people who know who it is do not mention the name. Um, but we, he said, What's going on? Well, we're collating Robert Bosconi. Would you like to help? He got very indignant. I said, No. Well, that's a fanish thing. I'm a professional. Professional writers don't do this sort of thing. And we said, Okay, let's understand this. And just then, Isaac comes out of the other room with a colleague and says, I'm running out of page three and four. Can you run some more off? That's the story. As we say, professional writers don't do that. It's a great story. Um, so I do not see any questions in the chat. Anybody? I believe Fred Lerner is waving, but I don't know if you can see him. Fred, why don't you go ahead and unmute if you have a yeah, question? Um, about 35 years ago, I was uh, having a Shabbat dinner at the uh, Dartmouth Hillel. There was a guest speaker, a professor from MIT, talking about some aspect of, of utopias and the like. I asked him if um, he, he mentioned having some trouble getting st uh, some of the research material he wanted. I asked him if he had ever used the Mitzvahs Library. He had never heard of it. He had to come all the way to Hanover, New Hampshire, to find out about something on his own campus. Well, that was a student activity. I had nothing to do with the teaching. Uh, there's there's a question about Drew White. Can can you, anyone share memories about him? I can also do that because. Um, Drew uh, and Tom Clarison, Darko Subin, uh, Ivor Rogers, and I were essentially the people who founded uh, the Science Fiction Research Association. Well, uh, basically, um, we had uh, Clarison and, and Subin as the uh, a scholarly uh, representation. I guess uh, you could say Drew White uh, represented uh, the serious collectors, mm -hmm. and uh, I was coming at it from, of course, the librarian's point of view. Well, Drew was the one who figured out how you file ace doubles on your shelf. You buy two copies. And you then there's no problem with filing them. He would always do that. He also brought out a publication called the Bibliographica Fantastica Futurica. Oh, yeah. But it was supposed to be monthly with the new books coming out. But the problem was Drew didn't want him. He wanted to give a little bit of review, which meant he had to get the books and read them before he could bring it out, which meant that his issues were always running a year to two late. Uh, Drew was he, he he was sort of independently wealthy, wasn't he? He was brought up to be that way, yes. Uh, his, family, his family had money. He yeah, really was if he, was. he was always like extremely well dressed, you know, yes. extremely well mannered. Um, but he <laughs> there there's this the story of the move where he had a ton of stuff, right? Nesfa Nesfa used to help people move in those days. Yes. We were, well, all, we were younger and could lift things. We were younger yeah. and could lift things and mostly broke. And he had like a lot of stuff. And so from then on, any move that we did was measured in Drews. Actually, in Miller Drews. <laughs> yeah. One is a quarter of a Drew, a tenth of a Drew. You know? <laughs> Wasn't Drew also the Nesfa official punster? I don't no. remember. Um, it was after my time. Puns. Isaac did a lot of puns. Drew eventually uh, married a widow from Brazil. And I am actually in contact with one of his daughters uh, in Brazil, a junior white. Really? Oh. Oh. Hmm. 
because she actually posted, do you know, did you know Drew White and Ed Meyer? I said, yes. <laughs> Friended on Facebook. Um, I had not realized he had had any children there. But, uh, I knew there was a family there, a, fr a pre-made family, but I hadn't realized he had contributed to it. He was a very pleasant person, very nice. Yeah, um, I liked him. Um, I, Jerry is turning out a bunch of questions. Uh, I think I just unmuted myself. Yep. Um, so, so the first thing was the, the first question is when did the pun finds come in? Was that in the sixties, or did that happen? That late? was at the very beginning, as soon as Isaac started attending meetings. <laughs> it's like making money off of this we didn't have a clubhouse then we right. were meeting often at tony's place in belmont other people other okay. other um people's and then, houses and i think fairly early we had the split between the business meeting and the other meeting yes we originally had i think two business meetings a month we didn't need that so we'd have a business meeting and then an other meeting and the other meeting was just social that answers a little bit of mark's question too is that we just have these monthly quote meetings and the other meetings tended to be a lot of different houses just to you know visit different people in different I places believe it was joe ross who made we couldn't figure out what to call them uh, joe said well it's the other meeting why don't we just call it the other <laughs> Practical. I thought, other... you, I thought you came up with that. I don't know. Oh, well, I thought it was your idea, Joe. But, uh, you know, I'm in my dotage now, so I may have forgotten. So am I. So my other question is, I, you know, I came into NESFA in the late 1990s, so well beyond any of this time frame. And as a Minneapolis fan, um, I had heard before about how NESFA was law and LA was chaos and Minneapolis was, was fairy. That's one of the things that Patrick <laughs> Nielsen Hayden had come up with. Um, but NESFA has a rules orientation unlike anything I had encountered in fandom before getting involved with NESFA. Um, and, and so can people talk about, you know, was that there from the beginning or did that develop over time? What were any discussions about we had, had a few friends whose fan act was writing rules. <laughs> <laughs> and just as some people wanted to write fanzines or collate or do art, that was their thing, writing rules. And the we club went along with it. What? The club well, went along with it. They enjoyed it. It was we Remember that the mitzvahs was a pretty anarchic organization. There were very few rules. There were lots and lots of officers, but most of them uh, were just uh, figureheads on a chart. Somewhere I have a chart that uh, Tony drew, and for all I know, it may still be part of uh, mitzvahs' organization. But uh, uh, I redrew it to put the the population or the, the membership up at the top, which made as much sense as anything. <laughs> I think that to some extent, Nesva's rules was a, a counter a reaction to uh, uh, yeah. Mitzvah's lack of rules. Well, Mitzvah's had the, said that we will follow Robert's rules as modified by the Palmyra Convention. Oh, yes. The Palmyra Convention said such things as motion to adjourn is debatable, but a motion to censure the treasurer is not. <laughs> Those were some of the... Some of it was just <laughs> silliness. What? Some silliness, of it was just yes. silliness. It was almost all silliness. The permission all... to get married was one of them that just, I was like, what? What? <laughs> Everything that was important got done uh, by people later on in the library or at House of Roy. I think the permission to get married started in Nespo when... Uh when uh, Lester Del Rey and Judy Lynn Benjamin announced their engagement. Yes. At least okay. that's my recollection. Well, thanks for your comments. I think that was Jack Butterworth. 
Uh, so Joy, no, not yet. Sounded, sounded like Joe Roth. Yeah, well, maybe it was. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to look at it from the things. All right, I think the next person is either Anne or Tim. So would you um, unmute and I will highlight you. Tim has left the room, so we're going to be delayed. All right. So Brad, uh, would you please go ahead then and unmute and ask your question? That's a high tech operation for me, but I've just figured it out. I, I just <laughs> I was curious to hear um, how uh, Nesra Press came about. That's an extraordinarily ambitious project uh, for a uh, a club to take on. So um, I'd like to hear about the origins of that. Nesra Press began with two people, Bob Weiner and Bill Desmond. And the idea was they wanted to print a little chapbook for the Bosco, and I forget who the first person, oh, Sprague to Camp, Scribblings. And the idea was that these were things that a writer had, that they weren't necessarily saleable as individual items, but over the years they had collected these things. And they would do a little, Bob was very much into printing itself. Uh, and Bill was into mostly the visual arts. And he also wore a lot of films and he was, uh, added a lot of pleasure to the meetings and quite knowledgeable. I think the, the initial uh, impetus was to do something for our guests of honor. Yes. It was tied in with Boscos that we'd publish something by our guests of honor each year. It really started after the 60s, though. I think that was Bosco 9, which would have been just after Norris Gun One. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And then but later. The, uh, prior to that, the only thing Desperate Press had done was the uh, indexes. Yeah. That's the seed. And those were uh, very special. There's not a large market for indexes to science fiction magazine stories. Libraries bought them. What? Libraries. Yes. Well, it turned out Locus stopped doing it because they found that in order to have a good, complete thing, we'd, they'd have to sell the books for some hundreds of dollars a book. To, and they just, there was not a market for it. And wasn't that also something of a, a project that came out of uh, Mitzvahs with uh, the yes. Filthy Peers Index? Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah we talked about that. Yeah. Uh, I think our next question comes from Rich Lynch. Rich, would you please unmute? There we go. Not really a question. Hiya. I seem to have been in Boston near the time that you were there. It was in the early 70s. And I got my, uh, uh, whoa, what is this? The, a master's in library science by going to the Mitzvah's library and uh, making a bibliography of A.E. Van Vogt. Not really a question. I'm sorry. Okay, so what, uh, what year was that, Richard? It was in the. It had to have been in the early seventies. Uh, and I think maybe about uh, seventy three or seventy four. Yeah, that's that's later than we're talking. Yeah, but it's still uh, old. <laughs> Okay, uh, Rich Lynch is next. So the other Rich, if you would unmute, please. I'm here, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I was wondering if anyone had talked about the origins of the Skylark Award. Yeah. No, not yet. Would you please? Well, at the earliest Boscos, we thought it would be really nice to have an award because everybody had one. And a category that wasn't being uh, fulfilled at that point was giving an award to somebody that we really, really thought was a great uh, force in the field of Skiffy science fiction and fantasy, but hadn't received any awards. 
So we chose one. And uh, in some conversation, I don't recall the details, we decided that it would be really hard to do a Skylark, but we could do a lens. So the award was uh, created in the form of a lens uh, for Doc Smith's other series. I think it was just after Doc Smith had died. I don't remember the details. It was while I was still there because I put the first lens together with some stuff from Edmund Scientific. That's where it comes from still. Is it really still? Yep. I haven't seen That's great. Yeah. Two plano convex lenses and a diffraction grating in the middle. Mm -hmm. Looks really cool. Yeah, I think the idea was someone who made a contribution and also who was a good guy. Yeah. Apparently, Doc Smith was well-loved. I never met him, so I don't know. But that was Who was the, the first winner? Was that, was that was Fred Paul? Winner? Was that Fred Paul or was it someone else? I don't remember. Look it up. Al Clement, I think. Al Clement. Oh, Al Clement would be a good candidate. Yeah. Yep, there's no gooder guy than Al Clement. Yep. Uh, do we have any other questions? Mark, I don't see any more questions in the chat. No, actually, it was Fred Pohl, according to this list. Hal got it eventually. Fred Pohl, Isaac, John Campbell, Hal Clement, Judy Lynn, etc. Oh, Hal yeah. Clement, I think, presented it to Fred Pohl. I think maybe, that, maybe. That, yeah. That's been it must have been Boscone too. It was the Boscone <laughs> after uh, Doc Smith died. So there's some more. 66. Yeah. yeah. And he died 65. Edie, yeah. I think Jack Butterworth was waving. Uh, Jack, unmute. Hi. Um, I was I was just curious because every month in your uh, reports, I see a listing for silent and silly committees. And I'm kind of curious as to whether there has ever been a, uh, anyone has any recollection of the silliest silly committee report ever submitted under, under that, uh, t under that heading. Well, we had the Desva Aerospace Cadets. Uh, that was people who were in silly, but, air patrol or something no uh it was all the people who were involved with piloting hal clement uh, paula was uh a member there was the cavalry the cavalry those were the people who rode horses yeah uh there was a cat goddess uh, there was a nest for Navy. There was people who <laughs> poorly paddled canoes, as I recall. At least I poorly paddled canoes. Hmm. Chrissy was the cat goddess, right? For a while, yes. This sounds like just an outgrowth from Mitzvah with its peculiar committees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Traditions. It oozes. This <laughs> I think Hal Clement's dog was named an honorary cat at one point. Yes. I think there was debate on that, a significant debate. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, Edie, Edie yeah. just posted she thought we should do an 80s talk. I think you should do a 70s talk and an 80s talk and a 90s talk. Uh, if we have the interest, we ought to do that. I'd attend them all. Good. It's the Good. only way I'd ever find out what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions about the 60s or early 70s that we can go for? I think we're going to leave the 80s for another time. Okay, Mark, I am not seeing any any um, questions in the chat. And if anyone has their hand up, please put it in the chat. And I guess I'd ask people if you have any closing comments. No. Well, Tony's Tony is this. Tony's the senior person here. He should go first. Yeah. About what? Closing Are comments. You... I think 
each of us could natter on for a couple of hours. Um, there's lots of things that happen that we, we should never talk about. <laughs> oh, please. That's Tell the stuff more. that we want to hear, but we really shouldn't talk about it. So we're not. No. Um, I'm looking here at the questions. So this is the whole Nesra's moon thing. Yes, that's true. There is the whole Nesra's moon thing. Um, I don't know if when you stop the recording, you could just leave the um, Zoom up for a little while, you know, if anybody wants to just hang out. I, I see a thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, I'm, I'm I, well, oh, I was, we I was waiting for Tony to finish, so I didn't want to step in. Okay. I can talk well, about many more things, but uh, the, not the embarrassing ones. Not the embarrassing ones. Some of them would be interesting to some people, but not to very many people. Well, I want to say I'm really glad that uh, I found the mitzvahs and uh, the people who founded Nesfa and was involved in all this stuff at the time and continued on doing doing this, doing conventions and other things. Never as as a chairman of a convention, I would like to point out. Uh, I know my limitations, but uh, because of uh, mitzvahs uh, and uh, fandom, I wound up uh, in the printing technology business and started an electronic book publishing company in, in 1999 and a lot of other things that I would have gone off and done something totally different if it hadn't been for Nesva, if it hadn't been for mitzvahs. Thank you. Leslie? Well, I have the same, you know, I alluded to that earlier that I thought that getting involved in fandom made a huge impact on my life, I think for the better. And um, I'm, I'm love all the people I've met over the years. And um, I'm amazed that people are interested in what happened 60 years ago, but happy to talk about as much of it as I can remember. So thanks. I had no real friends in high school. It wasn't until I got to college and misfits that I really had made some friends. Mark, do you have any last comments? No. I, I, I found this fascinating. Thank you. So thank you to all of our panelists. Our, uh, thanks for, for coming today and thanks for the attendees. And this is the end of our recorded portion of this talk.